from the research bench to the patient's bedside, this is Bench to Bedside with your host, Vice Chancellor and Director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. If you have acute leukemia, certain forms of lymphoma, a myelodysplastic syndrome, or a myeloproliferative disorder, and you are in need of a blood and marrow transplant, what do you do if you can't find a match in your family or through the Be The Match registry? If you're a person of color, this is unfortunately a very common problem. There are simply not enough people of color enrolled in the Be The Match registry. Fortunately, there are alternatives that can significantly reduce your wait time for a transplant. The University of Kansas Cancer Center has made significant advances in haploidentical transplants. This enables people who thought there was no hope to find matches almost immediately. We'll explain what a haploidentical transplant is in just a few minutes, but first, we have two very special guests uh, this morning joining us. Cece Rojas and her son, Nicholas Collins, Cece was first diagnosed with lymphoma in 2017. After being in remission twice, Cece's cancer reappeared for a third time. After her second cancer recurrence, her doctors told her she needed a blood marrow transplant. And it turns out her son, Nicholas, was a match. And Nicholas saved her life. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cece and Nicholas. What a special bond you two must share. We'll hear more about your family journey in a moment, but I also want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joseph McGurk. And Dr. McGurk is the division chair of hematologic and uh, malignancies and cellular therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And I want to thank you uh, for being here, uh, Dr. McGurk. Uh, could you ex please explain to us what a haploidentical match is? That's, yes. a bi that's a big word. You bet, absolutely. But to break it down uh, uh, in a straightforward, uh, simple way, uh, it means that you share uh, with someone else half of your chromosomes that code for your immune system. So mom and dad each give you their chromosome 6, which has the, the genes on it that code for the immune system. Uh, and so you have half a mom and half a dad. So your kids will uh, all be, by definition, at least half matched with their parents, and there's a, uh, a very good chance that any brother or sister will be half matched with you as well and have received one of those chromosome sixes. Mom and dad each have two, as you know. Uh, and uh, geez, just 25 years ago, these transplants were absolutely impossible. Different centers had tried, very few different centers had tried, and they, uh, they, they were uh, really s uh, simply failures, um, crossing those barriers. What we historically have looked for is a perfect match in the family. So same chromosome six from mom and dad, a perfect match uh, for, for transplant. This is different than blood type, so not matching for the blood type. Um, uh, 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 knowing that only about 25 to 35 percent of people would have a brother or sister who's a perfect match gave rise to a worldwide registry of unrelated donors. Now there are about 25 million people in these registries willing to donate stem cells for someone like Cece who's in need of a stem cell transplant to optimize a chance of being cured. However, that registry greatly overrepresents Caucasians of Western European descent. And so if you're Caucasian Western European descent, your chance of having a match about 75%. But if you're anybody else, African American, Hispanic American, Native American, mixed race couple, your chance of having a match in that registry is much less than it is for Caucasians of Western European descent. So access to allogeneic transplant, potentially curative, much less for those populations of patients with these aggressive blood cancers that have relapsed. So maybe to uh, preempt a, a question that's likely to come from our audience, uh, what patients are the best candidates for this type of transplant? Generally, patients who have high-risk uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, uh, uh, diseases of the um, uh, uh, blood stem cells giving rise to acute leukemias, acute lymphoblast leukemia, acute myelogenous leukemia, uh, and patients with myeloproliferative disorders uh, and myelodysplastic syndrome, other types of blood cancers. So uh, in general, blood cancers. 
It's used for some more rare disorders, such as bone marrow failure syndromes, severe aplastic anemia, and a non-cancerous but life-threatening condition as well. But those are the most common indications for allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Okay. So, um, CC, uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, your cancer experience. Could you um, uh, fill us in on uh, some more of the details there? Sure, absolutely. I was um, diagnosed in 2017 with lymphoma. And, um, you know, I went through standard of care uh, with, you know, chemotherapy um, and uh, was successful and in remission for about seven months and then relapsed for the first time. At that point, I was determined, it was determined that I could be, it would be potential um, option for me would be a clinical trial with CAR T. So I, um, I did go through the CAR T trial um, and um, it was a uh, successful again. I was in remission for about nine months that time, nine or 10 months, and then um, another relapse. So, uh, you know, coming back, um, you're pretty disappointed, you know, when you go through a trial like that. And it's, it's a, it's a long process and to find out that, you know, it's, it, and it came back in a really weird place too, you know, not in a traditional place, at least the way I think about lymphoma cancer, but um, so <clears throat> Uh, and speaking with the, the team there, the BMT team at KU Cancer Center, they determined that it was probably best for me to go through another CAR T treatment as a bridge to get me to a bone marrow transplant. And I, you know, at that moment, I knew that that would be my best option would be a, a bone marrow. Um, <clears throat> so that um, started the process for me of getting mentally ready for that <clears throat> and what it you know what it would mean for me from a physical perspective because i know it was it's a very hard process to go through um and then of course you know a lot of questions go through your mind in terms of a match you know you got to make sure that you can find a match that's a big piece of the puzzle and um so that's you know that started that that part of the journey for me okay so just to clarify cc what was your son a a half match or a typical match he was a half match. Okay. And, and what, was, uh, what was it like the moment that you learned your son was the match that could save your life? Well, I was obviously elated. Um, and, you know, I, was, it, I, was, I felt so fortunate, you know, that I had somebody in my immediate, you know, family that could, that could potentially, you know, be a match and, and help. And it was, it was, you know, it was even, you know, obviously better that it was my son um and then i you know felt you know really confident that the process would you know god willing and everything lined up from a you know physical perspective that it would be you know it could be you know life saving for me well that's uh that's an incredible story nick i can't imagine how tough um this was to see your mom in such a vulnerable vulnerable position can can you talk with us uh, a little bit about the moment you learned that uh, you were a match it was definitely a relief um, going in and, you know, having some of the conversations. We knew that there was, um, you know, there, were, there wasn't a very high a chance of match with the, with the registry. And so the you know, second I found out that I was a match and, and could be a donor, I was, we were, I was relieved and I was, you know, we as like a family were so relieved that this was a possibility. That's great. Um, we want to check in with Alexis Del Cid, who's standing by taking questions from viewers uh, in the community uh, on Facebook. Alexis? We're getting a lot of good questions about the process of being a donor. And a question I've gotten in a couple different ways is people are wanting to know some clarification of what's the difference between blood marrow and bone marrow. That's what Alonzo has been asking me on Facebook. Yes, absolutely. So the um, a stem cell is what's operative here and uh, critically important. And stem cells normally don't circulate in the blood, certainly not in large numbers. Uh, it would be uh, very rare for a stem cell to be seen out in the bloodstream. They live in the bone marrow like a queen bee in a beehive. There aren't very many of them, uh, relatively speaking, compared to the other blood cells. Uh, and they give rise to daughter cells that turn into different uh, components of our immune system. Uh, now we can uh, collect those stem cells to perform a life-saving uh, procedure like Cece went through with a bone marrow transplant and using her son as a donor, taking him to the operating room, putting him under a general anesthetic, flipping him on his belly and harvesting about a quart 
of bone marrow from multiple punctures in his pelvis and taking that bone marrow then to CC and infusing it like a blood transfusion, those stem cells make their way through the bloodstream to the bone marrow, they lodge, uh, in a couple of weeks they start growing this uh, new immune system, the blood type changes to that of the donor and if uh, the donor has seasonal allergies and CC doesn't, she's gonna get seasonal allergies, all of the immune system changes to that of the donor. Now there's another way to collect those stem cells and that is stimulating with protein injections under the skin, a, a protein called GCSF, stimulating the stem cells to break away from their cubby holes. They have tentacles and they hold on in the bone marrow, these queen bee stem cells. We can break that connection and then they'll get taken up in the bloodstream that's sweeping by them, take those stem cells out into the bloodstream and then we can use an intravenous line in the arm or in a large neck vein uh, to collect those stem cells in large numbers uh, for infusion into the patient. It's the same stem cell, peripheral blood stem cell versus bone marrow stem cell. We're just moving it around differently. And there are different risks and benefits of those two different procedures, both for the donor and for the recipient. Mika has a follow-up question. She wants to know, for Nick, uh, what did it feel like afterwards? Was there a recovery time? Were you, were you in pain? Was it a long process or procedure? The procedure itself was did not take long at all. Um, I did go under general anesthesia, but I was up and around probably about an hour or two after the procedure, and the the site was sore for maybe a day, two at the most. But um, I was at KU, so I was extremely comfortable, and the whole process was was streamlined. That's good news for people who are considering donating. Yes. Um, I have, I have a question. Can I ask uh, doctors this? We've talked a lot about um, the desperate need to have donors and people who are in the Be The Match registry. Is that an easy process? Is that an involved process to sign up? It's a relatively uh, straightforward, easy process. doesn't even require a blood draw initially, just a swab in the inside of the mouth, and then that goes off to the laboratory. We used to draw a lot of blood tubes initially, uh, and there may be some blood draws in the future if you end up being selected as a donor. There will be for further testing. But that initial test uh, to get you into the registry is simply a swab in the mouth, uh, and then it's put in a packet and uh, sent off for analysis. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, American Red Cross and the National Marrow Donor Program and Be the Match Program uh, facilitate the, uh, 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 those donations, uh, getting into the registry in the first place, and then helping us get the donor activated once uh, we've uh, chosen a specific donor. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that we get underrepresented populations into that registry um, so that we have more options for our patients. Critically important that we have Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, African Americans, mixed race couples. The more people of diversity we get into the registry, the more likely it is these people are going to be able to access potentially life-saving therapy. But again, novel therapies have ex ex extended uh, this life-saving uh, uh, procedure uh, into these underrepresented populations in the form of umbilical cord blood stem cell transplant, and as Dr. Jensen uh, uh, was discussing, haploidentical or uh, half-matched stem cell transplants from family members like Nick. So just to make sure we don't set up any false expectations here, are, are there age limits in terms of uh, signing up for Be The Match? Or Yes, yeah, there, there, there certainly are. Uh, preferably, we, we, the, the National Marrow Donor Program is looking for donors 40 years of age and less. But donors uh, for in, in the registry uh, who are older, uh, up to 60 years of age, can uh, serve as uh, stem cell donors in the registry. But increasingly, there's a large, large number of people who are in there. Younger donors uh, result in better outcomes for uh, patients undergoing stem cell transplant. We love the question. So keep your questions coming and be sure to share this link while you're watching this on Facebook with anyone else that you think would benefit from this conversation. And we'll keep asking your questions. So uh, Dr. McKirk, uh, obviously uh, CC and Nick are really a best case you know, scenario here. Uh, what if someone is watching who doesn't have a family member that is a full or haploidentical match? How, how do they find a donor? We still have options, it's a great question. The majority of, uh, uh, of patients in need will have a haploidentical donor available in the family somewhere. It doesn't have to be 
a, a child or a parent or a sibling. It can be a cousin. Those uh, whole chromosomes get passed uh, through generations, as you know. And so we uh, oftentimes will do an extended family search to identify a haploidentical or half-matched family member among uh, cousins, even second cousins, aunts and uncles, etc. But there too, about 10 to 15 percent of the time, we don't come up with a haploidentical donor. So what are we going to do? We can cross some of those barriers to doing mismatched transplants using unrelated donors uh, and umbilical cord blood stem cell donors and do mismatches there that can result in successful outcomes for such patients. Are all uh, children haploidentical potential donors for their parents? Uh, yes, they okay. are. So if you're just joining us, we're here with Dr. Joseph McGurk, uh, Division Director of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center to talk about alternative donor transplant options and the need for more diversity among Be The Match donors. Also joining us are Cece Rojas and her son, Nick Collins. Nick was uh, his mom's bone marrow donor when Cece was diagnosed with lymphoma for the third time. So uh, CC and Nick, can you tell us about uh, the transplant experience ex itself? Uh, how long uh, roughly did it take and, and uh, what did that, uh, you know, what were some of the things that you went through during that? Well, I think I could start, I mean, the process to get ready for a transplant is several weeks long, you know, to make sure that you're healthy enough and um, there's, lots of tests that you have to undergo and make sure that you successfully, you know, complete. Um, and, you know, so I was in the hospital for, you know, probably a week before I received my, um, my bone marrow. Um, I mean, yes, my uh, blood marrow transplant and <clears throat> the process itself was really uneventful. It was, you know, just you're in a chair, you, you're, you uh, receive your, um, you know, your, your uh, infusion. And then, you know, it's still pretty uneventful for a couple of days, but then after that, you really begin to feel the effects of it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, once again, it is, it is not an easy process. I was hospitalized for several weeks. Um, and, you know, it was several months before I, I felt like I was even, you know, felt halfway normal. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, had excellent care the KU Cancer Center and the team there, they were very kind and um, they understood and had much empathy for me what I was going through. But um, it was, uh, you know, it was a process though that was, at, you know, I felt like, I always felt like I was in great hands the whole time, every step of the way, and that I was surrounded by experts. And, and Nick, uh, tell us about your experience. Um, it was it was a seamless uh, process. Um, from the second I found out that I was a match, um, I went into KU. I did you know did the test to make sure that everything was good, and it, it was it was it was a great process because um, when I went to KU, they answered all my questions and I felt informed the whole way through. I, I knew what was going on, and. Be, being you know, a science teacher, I, I love the science of it too. And just everybody was so knowledgeable. And I mean, I learned so much about the process and the actual transplant itself did not take very long. There was not much discomfort. There wasn't a lot of pain. Um, it, 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 for me, um, as a donor, it was a quick process. Um, it was an in and out on a, on a Friday morning. That's great. So, so Nick, where are you a science teacher? Uh, Lincoln College Preparatory Academy Middle School uh, on the Missouri side. Ooh, middle school kids, boy, you're you're tough. No, no, no wonder you were tough enough to uh, go through a transplant. Yeah, very good. All right, so Dr. McGurk, uh, let's talk about risks. Yes, sir. And um, uh, specifically those associated with this particular type of transplant, haploidentical, versus a fully matched um, uh, donor transplant. Absolutely. Historically, these were much higher risk transplants. And as I mentioned in the early years, 25 years ago, when we first started in the field doing these types of transplants, outcomes were very, very poor. But today, uh, in 2021, these haploidentical or mismatch transplants 
uh, are, uh, appear to be uh, approximately as successful as a perfectly matched sibling uh, donor transplant or a well-matched unrelated donor transplant. The causes of complications are some, somewhat different, and there are risk in all of these settings. Um, as you know, your bone marrow is an organ. It's a very complex organ, and it generates all the elements of the immune system that help uh, prevent cancers in us and, all, and, and, and help uh, prevent uh, life-threatening infections. So the, the, and makes all of our red blood cells to carry oxygen and platelets to stop us from bleeding when we cut ourselves. All that comes from the bone marrow. In uh, many of our patients, uh, the bone marrow itself is cancerous. Uh, that wasn't the case for CC when she was first diagnosed. Lymphomas often don't involve the bone marrow. They certainly can involve the bone marrow at later stages most commonly. Um, and, and so we give conditioning therapy, radiation and chemotherapy, to destroy as much of the cancer as we can, but we also intend to destroy the bone marrow and the immune system of the patient because it's problematic, and we don't want, in Cece's case, for her immune system to have survived, see Nick's cells as foreign and attack and destroy them. That's called rejection. We also have the opposite problem. What we're taking from Nick is his intact immune system, uh, uh, different parts of it, and infusing it into Cece. And his immune system inside of CC may recognize her as foreign and attack her skin, her liver, her intestines. That's called graft versus host disease. It's the opposite of organ rejection. And so CC had to stay on medications for some time to prevent that problem of graft versus host disease. Despite those medications, some patients will still go on to develop graft versus host disease. But with these haploidentical transplants, we've employed drugs in the early post-transplant period that have actually decreased graft versus host disease to the levels, at, in the context of a highly mismatched transplant, to the levels that we see with matched sibling donors or matched unrelated donors. Very acceptable incidence of graft versus host disease. In contrast, a solid organ transplant recipient, like a heart transplant or lung transplant recipient, who stays on these medications the rest of their life, we can trick the immune system of the donor, in, uh, our, in, in Nick and uh, Cece's case, Nick, we can trick his immune system into thinking that it belongs in his mom, get her off of those drugs after several months, which is important because they have lots of toxicities. Patients can still relapse after transplant, but remarkably, if they do relapse, God forbid, we can actually take lymphocytes, T cells, from the original donor, Nick in this case, infuse them into the patient without any further chemotherapy and put the patient back into remission. Those T cells can recognize and destroy cancers. So it's quite remarkable. So these are complex procedures. It takes a large multidisciplinary team like that at uh, Kansas University Cancer Center to make these transplants possible, but they appear today to be as safe as matched sibling donor transplants and matched unrelated donor transplants with very similar long-term outcomes. That's fantastic. Any additional questions? Oh, I do. Um, I have a question from someone who wants to know, when it comes to getting more people of color to donate or um, join the, the registry, how does that happen in a community? Are there certain organizations that you rely on to spread the word? Are there drives that people can host themselves? How does that happen? Yes, absolutely. So we tap in to community leaders like Cece uh, and others who uh, are uh, connected to uh, uh, specific populations, Hispanic, Latino population, for example, um, African-American populations. will. We, we uh, will sooner or later uh, be seeing community leaders and, uh, and tell them what the issue is. Many of them, unfortunately, have to be our patient at different times, like Cece, uh, and they carry the flag out there and let people know how, compelling, how, how compellingly important it is. I think Cece can talk about uh, boots on the ground level about how you get communities to become involved in such an important effort as um, uh, getting underrepresented populations in the registries. So it's uh, Dr. McGurk. Is uh, do you have any idea how many, uh, what percentage of folks in the Kansas City region are signed up with Be the Match? Um, far too few. Um, uh, uh, um, I think that, that for the populations that we're talking about, the underrepresented populations, uh, we haven't done a great job in the United States. There's been a big push by the Be the Match and then National Marrow Donor Program and community leaders like Cece. Uh, in bringing more attention to this and getting more people into the registry. We're making some headway there, uh, but um, uh, we need millions of them across the nation. So we have a lot of work to do yet to get more people in the registries. 
There are people who donate their blood on a regular basis. Alice wants to know if it's possible to donate your blood marrow or your bone marrow more than once or, or once a year regularly. How, how does that work? Can someone do that frequently? Uh, they can't do it frequently, but they can uh, be repeated donors twice. Now, sometimes we have to go back to the original donor in the registry, or we might have to go back to Nick, for example, and, and we did to get stem cells to boost the patient if their bone marrow isn't working qu as well as we wanted to at a certain time point after transplant. Or, as I mentioned, if the patient relapses, we may have to retransplant them or give them these lymphocytes I described earlier, these T cells. Um, so donors can donate uh, to, to, uh, to different recipients, but there's a strict limitation on uh, how many donations they're able to make. You said two? That's correct. That's the limit? Yes. Huh. So, uh, uh, Cece, you talked a, a little bit about uh, how long you were in the, in the hospital. Uh, how, how long have you been in um, uh, remission, and what was your recovery like after uh, bone marrow transplantation? say, versus the uh, CAR-T therapy? Well, it was definitely, um, the, the bone marrow process was definitely um, much more difficult to recover from than the CAR-T. I felt like after CAR-T, after about, you know, a month or so, six weeks, I felt was feeling fairly normal again, or not completely normal, but getting back to a normal level of activity or somewhat, um, but with the you know the uh, the bone marrow, it was definitely a lot a much longer process. Um, but I felt like there was a point when a water faucet is like just turned on, and all of a sudden I just you know once my appetite came back, then I I just felt myself you know getting better by in leaps and bounds. Um, and you know it's, I'm almost two years out. Um, I have my two year. Uh, checkup coming up um, in December and you know I feel really good and um, I I'm getting back to where I, I felt you know almost where I left off not quite but and you know I'm um, I'm just really grateful and I you know it, it just forces you situations like this just really help you find what's important in life and focus on that so and that's what I've been doing that's great so we've touched on this a, a bit, um, but um, in, in terms of the racial disparity when it comes to finding donor matches for, for people of color, um, what uh, can, well, what are we doing to um, uh, alleviate this issue? And, and what can uh, be done um, to uh, increase the donor rate and uh, why do you think there is this disparity? I think it's, uh, um, I, I, I'll address the latter question uh, first. Um, I, I think as a matter of us, the, uh, a good part of the onus is on us as educators in a, a large academic center and one of the largest transplant programs in the country uh, to get out into the community, to go to community events and community uh, affairs, to know who the leaders in uh, uh, in the community are and tap into them and take an opportunity to uh, uh, present this challenge uh, um, uh, in the field. Uh, oftentimes it uh, success begets success and because it was skewed in the first place and we had more Caucasians of Western European descent, they told their family and friends who may have been more Caucasians of Western European descent and they, they got into the registry and such, not entirely, there's diversity there of course. But uh, when, uh, whenever we uh, a t a transplant someone who's uh, in a, from an underrepresented population, uh, African American, Hispanic American, or Native American, uh, it sets off a cascade of events in their community. And we see an uptick in Kansas City, for example. Um, and uh, uh, to what I said earlier, Kansas City is no less successful than anybody else. As a matter of fact, we have a, one of the largest transplant programs in the country. So I think we do a good job in Kansas City. That having been said, we don't do a great job. Uh, nationally. Uh, and so I think every opportunity that we have, like that, like this today, uh, to spread the word uh, 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 such that we get people into the registry, it's very important. We have done some recent analyses to suggest that although haploidentical transplant is very good in lymphomas, for example, we're working on a manuscript right now 
with the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research, looking at unrelated donor versus haploidentical transplant outcomes. They're close, but unrelated donor perfect match is a little bit better. Or that's what we're seeing right now. So we've got, we need to have all the options on the table for our patients in need so they can look at the risk and benefit ratio and choose the best option that, that suits them. And we don't want to get boxed into, into a corner too tightly where we only have a single option uh, and, and it may or may not be our best option uh, for them. So just continuing to get that message out there through every venue that we can, looking to people like uh, Cece uh, and to Nick uh, to help us carry the message out to the community, uh, uh, the communities of greatest concern uh, for that. Even with that, there are still barriers to access. And as you know, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Dr. Jensen, uh, you've, you've been instrumental in this, um, uh, this national effort uh, to uh, break down barriers uh, for underrepresented populations. Stem cell transplant isn't the only place uh, that where we see barriers to access to care for underrepresented uh, uh, ethnic populations, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans. Um, we see it across the board in uh, timely cancer diagnosis, timely referrals, uh, having the socioeconomic wherewithal to be able to uh, access that care, being, having the education. We just have a lot of work to do across the board. And at cancer centers like ours, as you know, you have an entire division section of uh, scientists uh, and physicians who work on these issues uh, to improve access to care. Allogeneic stem cell transplant is unfortunately not an exception to, the, uh, to those challenges at this point. I have an idea. Why don't we ask Cece and all the people that she knows uh, to help us uh, reach these communities and um, really understand uh, the messaging that we need uh, to affect this change. What do you think about that idea, Cece? Well, I think that's excellent and we're up to the task. This is something where many people now are very passionate about and we want to be, um, we, we want to be helpful. We want to be um, an instrument to help you amplify, um, you know, the opportunities for our community to, you know, to create better outcomes, to create better health outcomes. Yeah, I, I have to admit that question was a bit of a plant because that's exactly what we're doing. We're engaging with uh, uh, CC to really uh, uh, understand this issue at, at a fundamental level and then uh, do something about it because, uh, we never want to be in a position where uh, Joel has to tell a patient uh, that we don't uh, ha have a match for you. So, um, Cece, when, when you uh, uh, sit here with uh, us and, and, and your son, did you ever dream that he would save your life one day? Um, no, but I'm, you know, it's, it was worth all of the, all of the, uh, angst he put me through <laughs> he was young so. <laughs> yeah. you know yeah so i i always knew that he was uh he was special and so this is just proves and bears it out you're, you're willing to forgive that b minus on the report card back in third grade now yeah. well you know that in the pyromania oh, yeah. <laughs> very good it, it, I think it's a reminder to parents uh, all over the city that, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to push things too far because you might need them as a, as a marrow donor someday. So there you go. And uh, Nick, now, now for your side of the, of the story, what would you like people to know who are watching and, and never considered registering to see if they were a match uh, for someone out there? Um, I, I would just say, you know, being a donor is a truly life-saving you know, decision and reg registering to be a donor can literally save someone's life, um, people like my mom. And so I would strongly encourage people to go out there, be informed, read the literature and, you know, talk to people and have the discussions about what it means to be a donor and, you know, what that process is and, you know, meet people. Um, who, who need a donation, who have done a donation, and really start the foundation for those good discussions. That's great. So, Dr. McGurk, can you give uh, that information out one more time about how people go about uh, registering? Yes, absolutely. They, through our local community blood centers, uh, through um, uh, our uh, transplant program, 913-588-9821, 
our uh, tra transplant coordinators get lots of those calls and uh, direct uh, people to how to get into the registry. You can go online and to be the match, and they're straightforward, really simple and efficient, quick uh, registry information on there. Uh, the uh, uh, recruitment of underrepresented uh, uh, populations uh, is a highest priority for the National Marine Donor Program for the last several years. So they've made it easy uh, for people to go online and get registered. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact our transplant program at the Kansas University Cancer Center, and we'll help give you uh, uh, further direction on that. Well, thank you, Dr. McGurk, and obviously uh, thank you to CC and Nick uh, for being with us uh, this morning. If you'd like more information on being a donor or transplant options, or if you want to register for Be The Match, go to bethematch.org. That's all for today. This is our last show for 2021. Join us for season nine in January uh, 2022. We will be live at the same time every Wednesday at 10 a.m. As we sign off, I would like to leave you with an inside look at our new care unit at Cambridge Tower A. This is uh, Dr. McGurk's uh, sandbox, essentially, and uh, it's a very nice looking sandbox, by the way. And this space was designed and built with the patient in mind and has many features of the envy of cancer centers across the nation, if not the world. Subscribe to our Bench to Bedside podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.